Heute geht es um ähm, eine Strafanzeige wegen vermuteten Verbrechen gegen die Menschlichkeit, welche im Oktober 2014 eingereicht worden ist, wegen der großflächigen Umweltschäden und ähm, der gesundheitlichen Schäden in dem Zusammenhang ähm, durch ähm, die Erdölaktivitäten der, ähm, von Texaco in Ecuador. Und äh, zuständig als äh, Anwaltssozietät für diese Anzeige in Den Haag ist die Sozietät Frombolliere aus Ecuador. Und ich darf nun äh, die Anwältin Paola Romero von äh, der Sozietät Frombolliere in unserer Sendung begrüßen. Hallo, Mrs. Äh, Romero. Hallo. Mrs. Romero, um, uh, when has the charge for suspected crime against humanity, um, according to Article 7 Roman Statute, been filed at the International Criminal Court? Uh, well, thanks for this interview. Greetings from Ecuador. Um, regarding your question, our complaint was originally filed on October 23rd, 2014. Um, I'll give you a brief, uh, brief description of the procedure that will follow our, our complaint. Um, Article 15 of the Rome Statute provides that the prosecutor may initiate investigations proprio motu on the basis of information of crimes within the jurisdiction of the court. So what we did is uh, deliver this information for the analysis of the prosecutor. And now she has to analyze the seriousness of the information that she received. And for that purpose, she can gather additional information uh, either from states or from organizations or any reliable source she deems appropriate. Um, if the prosecutor concludes that there is reasonable basis to proceed with an investigation, then the process will continue its normal path and we as victims will be allowed to make representations before our pretrial chamber. So we expect to have an, a decision over the admission of our claim in two or three months. Um, um, which uh, victims uh, do you represent? I represent the victims, um, the Ecuadorian victims from the Amazon, Amazon rainforest here in Ecuador that, live, uh, that have lived in, in, in the area where Texaco produced oil um, during approximately three decades. So when Texaco had its operations in Ecuador, their environmental procedures were the least appropriate and the damages that were left after their operation has been affecting these people for over 50 years now. So I represent at least 30,000 people that live in this area of the Ecuadorian Amazon. And um, how many uh, people have um, uh, suffered health damages because of those uh, contaminations and what are typical health damages which you refer to? Uh, well, since uh, the damages are in the, in the Amazon rainforest, um, the access is, is not that easy. Still, the percentage of illnesses that are present in the area are three times more, for example, illnesses as cancer or skin conditions, where um, that are, those are the, the illnesses that affect the people the most. And in this area of the Amazon rainforest, these illnesses are three times more than anywhere else in Ecuador. Um, the, the, the people have to live in in direct contact with the pollution. You can find the pollution today in the waterways, for example, the rivers, marshes, streams, or any other water bodies, and people are still getting sick. Um, you have families where all the, all the family members have been uh, affected by cancer. At least um, one person per family has reported to have cancer. 
And uh, the damage is so serious that when Texaco first came to Ecuador, seven indigenous communities lived in that area and they claimed that as, as, their, as their territory. Uh, sadly, due to these operations, two of those communities, indigenous communities, were completely lost. So now the remaining five communities are part of the, of the victims that are fighting Chevron all over the world. What, what does it mean that, that, they, uh, that they are lost? Have, um, have they died or have they had they to, um, to leave the area? You have all types of situations. You have people who, who, like thousands of people who have deceased, died due to cancer or other sorts of illnesses. Uh, but you also have people that have had to move away from their homes and, and the land that they, that they grew up in because the conditions, the environmental conditions are not um, healthy and, and they're not, uh, they're not they do not allow people to, to live there because uh, the contamination is, is so strong. So the, the water is contaminated, the soil is contaminated. If you farm animals in those areas, the animals would die. So people have had to be um, moved away from their homes, but you have thousands of people who have died as well. Um, um... If I understand it correctly, the health damage comes mainly from the polluted water? Yes, the health damages come mainly from the polluted water, but also from the pollution that you have in the ground, in the soil. Um, people live in areas that uh, were not appropriately cleaned up after Texaco's operation. So um, being so close to this, to this pollution, uh, is, is making them sick still today. Um, if I got it uh, correctly, um, then there um, are remains of mineral oil of uh, 71 million liters and um, uh, 64 million liter uh, raw uh, oil on uh, more than tw uh, 2 million um, hectares. That's right. Um, Texaco left behind hundreds of open air pits filled with toxic sludge. Uh, what is important at this point is for people to know that what happened with Texaco was not an accident. They, they didn't suffer a spill from their, from their oil operations. Uh, it's not comparable to the BP spill, for example, in, in, in the Mexican Gulf. What happened is that systematically, when they operated, they did not apply any safe technology to protect the environment and the people who lived there. So all the time where, when they were operating in these areas, uh, they were damaging the environment because they did not use the appropriate procedures and technology. The, 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 the pools where you gathered the, the, um, the water that comes out from the, from the oil exploitation, they did not have um, any, any separation from the, from the soil, from the ground. So the, that contamination was going directly to the ground and afterwards to the, to the water. And that contamination is still there. If I, um, if I wanted in, uh, to start a gas station in Germany, um, uh, I would um, have uh, to make a separation from, uh, to the groundwater for any possible oil spills. Exactly. Um, and that's because the procedures and the requirements in Germany, I guess, are, are very um, environmental. Um, they protect the environment. Uh, very well. What happened here in Ecuador is in that the Texaco started operating here in the country around the 1960s. And that is when we were first starting to exploit oil, oil here in Ecuador. That's when uh, that was a very, very 
soon after oil was discovered here in Ecuador. So the procedures and the, and the requirements were not legally that high. And they're pretty, uh, they've gotten better with time, over time. But Texaco did not apply the best technologies that they had at their disposal. What happened is that when they were back, at the, back in that time, they were also operating in, in the United States. And the technology and procedures they used in the in the United States were much better and, and much safer for the environment and the people. But what they did in Ecuador um, was uh, they used some other technology, like old technology and procedures, because it was cheaper. So they made an analysis, a, a conscious analysis of what technology they they wanted to use here in Ecuador. And they decided to go for the cheaper one. And that was a conscious decision. And the damages they, they caused because of these decisions were uh, absolutely the, the, the normal consequence that, that would have happened of applying those procedures. Um, can you give an ex uh, imagination um, about uh, the difference of the technologies they have used at Ecuador and they already uh, would have been able to use them? Yes, um, the main example that, that, we, that we must use is the open air pits where they, uh, they put the water that comes out of the oil exploitation those it, here in Ecuador in Spanish we refer them as pools. Um, those pools need to be protected from the from the ground. They need to be separated from the ground uh, with with a, a, a material that does not let the oil, the polluted water with oil, go to the ground. It, it's like a membrane. That membrane was not applied to these pools. So the, 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 what Texaco did was they made those pools directly into the ground and they put the water there and then the, the water naturally went into the ground, contaminated the ground, and that water also went to the natural waterways, for example, rivers or or streams, and that contamination is, is so so dangerous and, and so deep that you need a process of cleanup that is very, very expensive and that would take a lot of time, and Texaco never did that. They never cleaned up after what they did when they left Ecuador. Um. And one could argue that um, these events have been um, so long ago. And if I look at the Roman Statute, uh, Article 11 and Article 126, uh, then the own Roman Statute is only applicable on actions which um, have taken place, um, on, on events which have uh, taking place uh, from July the 1st of 2002 on. And um, what can the ICC do about um, um, these uh, events or the results of these events uh, which have uh, taken place before um, June 2002? Yes, um, that is correct. The, the Rome Statute establishes that they can only they only have jurisdiction over crimes that have been committed after 2002 and what we were um, what the situation i was describing up to this point is the situation that people here in ecuador are facing because of what texaco did uh, but this is not what we are denouncing as a crime so the crime we denounce in our complaint is not the environmental damages and pollution per se. Instead, the criminal actions over which we consider the court has jurisdiction is Texas, uh, Chevron's CEO, his name is John Watson, 
uh, he is making voluntary and systematic decisions and he has planned out a strategy that aims to disregard a final and binding decision that orders Chevron to pay for the Ecuadorian Amazon cleanup. Um, I don't know if, if you have enough context, but the indigenous communities and, and the people in the Amazon, in the Ecuadorian Amazon, filed a complaint against Chevron 20 years ago, over 20 years ago, first in, in New York, in a New York district court. And we fought Chevron for over 10 years in New York. And after 10 years, the New York court decided that the case should be tried in Ecuador because here is where the damage is. So they sent the case to Ecuador. Uh, that was in 1993. From that year on, we fought Chevron here in, in the Ecuadorian courts for almost 10 more years. And after all of these years, three different Ecuadorian courts have decided that Chevron is responsible for the damages in, to the environment and to the people in the Ecuadorian Amazon, and that they should be um, made responsible by paying for the cleanup that has to be done in the Ecuadorian Amazon. Uh, these decisions were made by three different courts, and that includes the Supreme Court here in Ecuador. So Chevron is liable for, for, for these damages. They have to pay for the cleanup, and now John Watson, its CEO, what he's trying to do is to avoid acknowledging this responsibility and paying for the cleanup, arguing that uh, the Ecuadorian courts are corrupt and that they're fraudulent and that they're not important enough to make a decision as this, so they're not going to recognize this judicial decision. And they are also saying that the victims, that 30,000 people that we represent, are um, criminals and they have filed an action against the victims in, the, in New York uh, before a judge that's called Judge Lewis Kaplan. And they are uh, arguing that the victims have planned a, a big scheme and, and fraud against Chevron to collect the money that, that is not, um, that, that, is, that is not justified. Um, this, this, strategy that they are applying to avoid recognizing this responsibility has a consequence. And this consequence is that the people in the Amazon rainforest are going to keep on getting sick. They are not, um, they do not have the conditions to stay in their house, in their homes and live in their territory. And they have to move because the pollution is still there. And Texaco, now Chevron, is voluntarily deciding to not acknowledge a judicial decision that makes them responsible for the damages and orders them to pay. And this, all of this strategy is made by John Watson, Chevron's CEO, and that is, that is the crime that we're denouncing. His voluntary decision to put together a plan and a strategy to maintain these people in these conditions, which are um, violating their rights. Um, I, and Chevron has done, uh, I think Chevron could have done, even if they don't accept any uh, liability under tort law, um, say, why, I asked myself, why did they not make, um, let's say, voluntary um, payments to improve the condition of the people. If they uh, don't accept any guilt under tort law, they could have at least helped um, the, uh, the people from their position maybe voluntarily. Well, um, sadly, over 20 years, in over 20 years of litigation against Chevron, uh, what we have learned is that this company is 
is the worst company in the world and they don't have a single bit of good faith that would require uh, them to voluntarily help the people in the Amazon rainforest, even if, even if they didn't recognize the responsibility. Um, not only that, but uh, they, they, they have demonstrated such a bad faith in this litigation process that John Watson has promised publicly, he has promised the victims a lifetime of litigation. So he, once he, 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 he was making a public statement and he told the, the, the um, reporters that Chevron was gonna litigate until the until hell freezes, and then he was he was gonna keep on litigating on ice. So uh, you can you can you can see in how bad faith Chevron is now operating. But all of these decisions that, that the company is making are responsibility of its CEO John Watson, because it, it is important to know as well that John Watson does not only um, direct the company as its CEO, but he is also head, head of the board. So he has no one over him supervising his decisions. One of the, of, the, um, of the petitions that the victims have made to the board of shareholders is that, that they separate John Watson from either of those two positions he he can be CEO or head of the board, but someone needs to be supervising the decisions that are being made. Hmm. Um, if uh, the ICC now can uh, uh, go back to uh, June, uh, sorry, to July two thousand two, and everything which has not been done to um, bring the people. Um, in the Ecuadorian Amazon out of uh, the situation. Um, has from that time on always been Mr. Watson the CEO for that long time? Well, the involvement that Mr. Watson has had in the company um, runs back even before he was the CEO. He, he used to be a consultant for, for for Chevron um, in, in the past, and, and this is a very interesting fact. When he was a consultant, he was the person responsible for Texaco's and Chevron's. Um, when 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 Chevron bought Texaco, it was under the advice of John Watson. He was the person who advised Chevron that it was a good business to buy Texaco. And then this is very important because when he did so, he did not disclose all the proper information that Chevron would have needed at that point about the responsibilities and liabilities that Texaco had. For instance, he never disclosed to the board of shareholders of Chevron that Texaco was liable in this Ecuadorian case and that Texaco was going to be responsible for paying almost $10 billion. Uh, now that he is CEO, he needs to fight these judicial decisions that have been made in Ecuador because he cannot acknowledge and, and he cannot um, accept that the advice he gave to Chevron when when he told them to buy Texaco, that that was bad advice, that he, that he should have never advised Chevron to buy Texaco. So he has to sustain that decision as long as he can and, and with all of, of the power he has available to him. And that is part of why he is fighting the decisions so bad and that he's not going to, he's not going to, um, voluntarily help the people in the Amazon rainforest. Because um, else it might be that the shareholders would make make him uh, financially liable for his he, advice of that time. There's a possibility that he would be financially uh, liable as well. 
but most of all, uh, it, 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 it is a matter of, of his name, you know, he, he has a, a, a long um, experience in, 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 the, in the area and, and he is a very important person for, for, for the oil companies in the world. And he cannot lose all the power he has over, over this case in Ecuador and, and the decision that he advised Chevron to do in the past, not opening all the information that the shareholders needed to make that decision. Um, let us um, have a, a look um, to the um, mental part of the uh, Roman Statute, the mental part of the Roman Statute, if you look at Article 7 and Article 30, a Roman Statute um, requires a certain degree of intention that um, the perpetrator um, knows about uh, the widespread or uh, systematical attack and that the perpetrator um, uh, nevertheless at least wants what he is doing, what he is uh, contributing to that attack um, has uh, uh, what brings you to the conclusion that this uh, degree of in intent uh, of intention has been reached well um, the first part of the of this answer uh, goes back to something I mentioned before the crime we are denouncing before the ICC is not the environmental pollution per se and that is very important for us to, to differ, differentiate and to have clear. The crime uh, we are denouncing at this point is John Watson's strategy to maintain and keep the Ecuadorian victims under the unsafe conditions they are living currently. Uh, with that in mind, we have to, um, we have to understand that the sole objective of Watson's strategy is to avoid paying for the cleanup of the Ecuadorian Amazon. In doing so, he is completely aware and has full knowledge that in the ordinary co course of events, the consequence will be more deaths, illnesses, forcible transfer, and in, in, in some great suffering and, and, and affection of, of the mental and physical health of the people who live in the area. Watson's actions reach the degree of intention that is required by Article 30B of the statute, fulfilling the intentional requirement that the court must formally analyze. He is conscious that these decisions are keeping the people in, in, in the unsafe conditions and the uh, causing this great suffering and illnesses that affect their, their rights. That is how we, we have established uh, uh, this um, requirement for, for before the court, and that's what our, our argument is. Even though uh, Texaco made a conscious and, and voluntary decision to benefit the, com the, the, the company's economy by using cheaper technology and, and using um, unsafe procedures that caused all of these environmental damages. That is not a crime that we are denouncing because that was before 2002. Uh, but it, it is very important to know that the company 20 years later is still consciously and voluntarily deciding to maintain the, the communities under the same conditions they caused in the first place, even when they have legally been ordered to pay for the cleanup. Okay, so they must have had the information already from the court cases um, in Ecuador at, at latest, where they have uh, been ordered to pay the nine, uh, uh, point five uh, billion dollars for the cleanup and for the uh, damages. Of course, they're perfectly aware. Um, they have a, a massive media campaign against the victims and and even against our whole country. They they say Ecuador is a corrupt country where justice doesn't work. 
So that is the reason for not recognizing the judicial decisions that have been made here in our country. Uh, but this is a voluntary deci decision. They know that as long as they don't pay for the cleanup they are responsible for, people are going to continue suffering and dying. Um, so I think then the question arises, does possibly someone else, for example, the state Ecuador or the, the international community to ensure the um, clean up and to send the bill to uh, Chevron Texaco. Yes, uh, that, that's um, a very important question that has been uh, arised uh, through time. The Ecuadorian government um, is, is fighting Chevron in an international arbitration procedure as well. Uh, this is somewhat complicated to explain, but Chevron is using all the tools that it has at, at, at its disposal to, in, to try to avoid this responsibility. So they, when they got sued because of this environmental damage they, they caused, at the same time, or a little bit later, they sued the Ecuadorian uh, state, the Ecuadorian government, in an international arbitration procedure where their objective is that if they get, if, if they have to pay a single dollar for this cleanup, they're gonna, uh, they're gonna try to their argument is that Ecuador is responsible for the damages and not them. So this is a very, very, very complicated situation where Ecuador needs to uh, be very coherent with the arguments it has present uh, before the, before the, before the international, the, the arbitration panel. Um, I, I don't think that's the reason why they, the Ecuadorian state doesn't do the cleanup itself. Uh, the cleanup is very, very expensive. That's why Sharon needs to pay over $10 billion. So the Ecuadorian government is trying to, to uh, at least cover the basic needs that, that the people have, uh, water-wise, for, for instance, and not only the Ecuadorian government. For, uh, we have um, a lot of organizations, international organizations or NGOs, who have come here to Ecuador and, and, and after seeing what Texaco did, they have uh, organized uh, help and, and, and plans to, to for, for, for instance, get water to the people. That, that's the most important part. So we do have um, some help from, from the state or from, or from other organizations uh, regarding the, the, the the needs of the people, but the cleanup is something that is is already decided that Chevron needs to pay. So that, sadly, that won't be done until they pay. Uh, I understand the, the need for for coherence, and well, it's very very positive that at least that at least um, there's a strong uh, support that people. Um, living in the Amazon region have at least a safe drinking water. Um, exactly. And well, also today, oil firms are drilling in the Amazon region uh, of Ecuador. Do they behave uh, much more responsible than uh, Texaco at, uh, at that time and today? Well the situation today is is very different from what happened in the early 1960s. First, because the legislation that regulates these sorts of operations has um, is more technical and adequate. It, it is not uh, it does not reach the best levels of, of environment protection that we would aim, but at least we have uh, some some rules that the companies have to follow. 
that didn't happen back in the 1960s where we were very, very new at this uh, sort of, of industry. Um, still, the, the, there is no way, even today, there is no way of safe way of producing oil. Um, we have a, a long road ahead of us when it comes to environmental protection. Uh, however, we can say that without a shadow of doubt, the standards set forth by Texaco back then here in Ecuador uh, would be impossible to maintain anywhere in the world in, in the current times. Texaco's operation here in, in Ecuador is the best example of how you're not supposed to be extracting oil out of the ground. For example, today, the, uh, I would guess that the uh, drinking water, the groundwater is protected much better than uh, Texaco has done it. Yes, absolutely. For, for, for example, the, the, the waterways um, are protected. The, the, the pools where this um, formation water goes to, it has its protection from the ground, so it does not leak directly into the ground. And the, the the environment ministry is is the the entity responsible for making sure that the companies are following the rules. As I, as I was saying before, we have a long road ahead of us, and we still have very serious environmental problems here in Ecuador when it comes to the oil industry. Um, but yet the standards that are applied today are much better than those applied in, in, in the past, especially when Texaco had the, the, the biggest part of the oil industry here in Ecuador, and that was for over three decades. Um, is this the first presidential case uh, you know of uh, large-scale um, health damages caused by environmental uh, pollution and uh, with a link to Article 7, Paragraph 1, Lit K, Roman Statute, or other, other cases you know? There is no other case that we know of that has been filed and, and accepted by the court for environmental damages and a systematic and voluntary obstruction of justice. Um, this case is par paradigmatic in, in every sense of the word. Several social organizations are actively supporting us and there is even a discussion about the need for an international environmental court. Uh, this discussion at, at, at this point has gained a lot of momentum due to our, our the, the, the complaint we filed before the ICC. And, and it is all because of the, of the actions of these brave Ecuadorian victims that have refused to stand down and allow the multinational corporations to repeat this anywhere in the world. Um, when, when it comes to, to environmental crimes, there is no mechanism, international mechanism, that makes sure that, that the victims have, have a, um, a forum before they, they, they can go and, 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 and get justice. What Chevron is doing right now is that they are obstructing justice and they, and they say that this is a, a, a legitimate position because they don't accept Ecuadorian justice as a fair justice, as an as a, as a, uh, official justice. So this, is, this case is, is the best example of how multinational corporations are abusive of the power they have in the world, of the influences, political, economic influence, influences they have in the world, and how victims are not only suffering the, the, the pollution consequences of the environment, but they have also had to support 20 years of litigation here in, in our country, well, first in the, state, first in the States, then in, in our country, and now we are litigating in, in at least four jurisdictions in the world because Chevron does not own assets here in Ecuador. So we have had to um, enforce our, our 
judicial decision uh, in in three other countries where in that we're currently in that process right now we are enforcing our decision in Canada in in Brazil and in Argentina but we are also defending ourselves from Chevron's accusations and attacks in the New York District Court. Uh, we, we, we had a decision in, in April in 2014 where Judge Kaplan said that this, was, this case was all a fraud and that this was a scheme perpetrated by the, by the victims and the lawyers against Chevron and now we're currently in in the up appeal process before the second circuit in new york defending ourselves uh because of, of chevron's accusations so this is uh, as i was saying the best examples of how far the corporations can go and are willing to go to defend their power and to defend their right uh to to operate and 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 do things their own way without subjecting to any justice at all. Um, I would like to add a, a question uh, uh, regarding Article 7, Paragraph 1, Lit H, Roman Statute, um, the, um, which refers to persecution, uh, grave uh, human rights um, violations. Um, and, um, this refers to, to groups uh, of, of victims and uh, do you um, mean that regarding vulnerable groups? Um, sorry, can you repeat the question? Yes, you, you, yes. Were, you were mentioning Article 7, H, right? Uh, H, yes, yes, persecution. Uh, I think this refers to grave human rights violations and it also, I think, needs to refer to victim groups. Do you refer to vulnerable groups uh, living in the Amazon region and who are affected? We refer to um, indigenous groups that have been affected. There are two, two groups of people uh, living in, in the affected areas. You have the indigenous communities that, that, are, that have been there for, for hundreds of years and that they claim this as their ancestral territories. And you also have the, the farmers and the, and the other, other people that went to live in that area when the oil industry first started. So uh, you have these two groups of people that, that are being affected by uh, probably the worst part is for the indigenous communities. You, we, we have two communities that have been completely lost. They disappeared over these three decades of Texaco's operation in Ecuador. And the other communities um, have been affected for, um, for the, as well, uh, the, the illnesses, the, the, the cancer, the health damages they have had to support, but also because they have had to move away from their ancestral territories because of the contamination and the pollution. Um, you have um, you have said that there's a need uh, for international environmental court. Um, what should it focus on uh, on um, damages of, of, uh, against health or against the environment uh, itself and rather tort law or criminal law? Um, here in Ecuador, we we have um, a protection for for nature that is uh, one of the highest standards around the world. Our constitution prote uh, protects the, the nature um, at a level where nature has its own rights, its nature's rights. We, we know that that standard is, is far from being applied um, everywhere in the world. Still, what the discussion uh, revolves around when we talk about the International Environmental Court is crimes against the environment, per se, uh, crimes against nature. Uh, here in Ecuador, we have a, an important list of crimes against environment. Uh, Per se, so I, I guess that the international court, the, the international environment court, would be uh, 
judging these these types of actions for for example what what Texaco did here in Ecuador that is so uh, where, where, where the damage is so big and so important that it constitutes a crime against the environment and nature um where can we get uh, more pieces of information uh, of um, um, the, the further course uh, of, the, of your case at the ICC? Well, um, I'm gonna I'm gonna give you our web page. It's www.texacotoxico.org. Okay. And well, that that's in Spanish. You can you can uh, also go into chevrontoxico.org. That is that's the web page we have in English. Okay. You can find all the relevant information um, about the case and and about the and about the the, um, the damages that that people are are still suffering in, in these two web pages and there's there's um most part of the information I, I, if you need any other information. okay many thanks for the very competent overview over over the case and over, uh, over the situation uh, no thanks for uh, thanks to you for this interview uh, we we hope that that people all over the world um, support our case and, and support the victims against Chevron, because um, fighting Chevron is, is is such a an important task that we need all the allies around the world uh, we can get. Many thanks for taking your time and informing our, our listeners. Many thanks. Th thanks to you. Goodbye. Bye.